Okay, so welcome to our first session with the W's, doing what uh, would have been part two the first time around so that I don't do Frank Lloyd Wright too many times in a row. And we're starting with agents of change. In this section, we discuss social innovators who help change the world. Uh, and now I see why that's hiding and now I've got it in the open and now here we go. So our first guy is way back born in 1756. It's Gilbert Wakefield. Gilbert was an Anglican priest, but he left his post to become a Unitarian and to support himself by writing. I found his most successful book shown here, which was just a translation of the New Testament. I could not find either of the two political books that both put him in jail. The first time he got two years for applauding the French Revolution. Uh, that sort of worked out for him. Sympathetic supporters collected 5,000 pounds, a fortune back then, to support Gilbert and his family. It was more than he could have earned outside prison. Then in 1798, he wrote, quote, a reply to some parts of Bishop Landaff's address to the people of Great Britain, unquote, uh, which was basically Gilbert's complaint against the rich. He and his publisher, Joseph Johnson, each got six months in jail. Their prisons were comfortable, so it was mild suppression. I'm always intrigued to see in the British Isles how they suppress people, but with a little bit of restraint. Uh, so uh, it was mild suppression, but it was successful. Gilbert stayed non-controversial for his few remaining years. Next comes Mary Wollstonecraft, probably our biggest name under this section. She was a British proto-feminist and a prolific author. Mary was born in London. She grew up with an abusive father. And believe me, that is a label which the 18th century only used in extreme cases. She used to sleep outside her mother's bedroom to keep her mother safe. So she came to her feminist views in a hard school. As an adult, Mary continued having negative experiences in the traditional roles open to her sex and her class. She was a lady's companion to an angry, difficult widow in Bath. Then she cared for her dying mother. Then she started a school in North London with her sisters and a friend named Fanny Blood. But the school failed after Mary followed Fanny to Portugal to nurse her during an illness that killed Fanny at age 27. Mary was a governess in Ireland, where she did inspire the two daughters in her care, but she did not get along with the mother. At age 28, Mary moved to London to support herself as another of Joseph Johnson's authors. Her life experiences were the raw material for her first books. Thoughts on the Education of Daughters includes a chapter on, quote, unfortunate situation of females fashionably educated and left without a fortune, unquote. Then Mary, a fiction, was inspired by Fanny Blood's life. And then Original Stories from Real Life was based on her time as a governess. Mary was caught up at first figuratively and then very literally in the French Revolution. In 1790, she published A Vindication of the Rights of Men, which was an answer to Edmund Burke's criticism of the revolution. That book made her an instant celebrity. She followed it up with her most famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. It was big in the 1790s and it became big again with the rise of feminist criticism in the 1960s. She is one of the 100 most influential people of the millennium. She's number 48 on a and &E Biographies list and she's number 26 on Life Magazine's list. Mary went to Paris in December 1792, partly to escape scandal and partly to see revolutionary France for herself. She arrived just before the execution of Louis XIV and the Reign of Terror and the start of a war with Britain. Oh, Mary, what have you got yourself into? Most of her new French friends were in the Girondin party and several of them were executed by the Jacobins, news which caused Mary to faint. She also had an affair and a baby 
with an American adventurer named Gilbert Imlay. Gilbert gave her the protection of a pretend marriage and pretend American citizenship, being that Britain was at war with France. And then he left her and the baby to fend for themselves in real danger in Le Havre. Even so, her next book, An Historical and Moral View of the French Revolution, was optimistic about Republican France's future. Mary returned to London in April 1795. Gilbert Imley rejected her and she attempted suicide three times in the next year. However, she gradually formed an attachment to William Godwin, who loved her deeply and who married her when she became pregnant again. Her literary career was in good shape. She seemed to be at the start of better things. Well, it didn't happen. Like so many pre-modern women, she died from complications of childbirth. Her baby was this woman, born Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, better known as Mary Shelley, the woman who married Percy Bysshe Shelley and wrote Frankenstein. Next up, we have the Weston sisters, Caroline, Anne, and Deborah. Uh, the photograph is of Maria Weston Chapman, prominent abolitionist, whom I'm sure you all remember from the letter C. There will, of course, be a test when we finish the Zeds. Mary had five sisters and two brothers. These three sisters and eight other women joined Maria in founding the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society in 1834 which was one year after Britain had abolished slavery in the British Empire. I don't have I don't have any photos or paintings of the sisters, just their letters. Uh, Anne's letter uh, with all the crossings across it is not eccentric. Lots of people cross their letters like this to save paper, sometimes adding a third cross on the diagonal. Not everyone in the free states was an abolitionist. In 1835, a mob of men came to break up a BFASS meeting. To avoid trouble, the mayor of Boston asked the women to leave. Maria replied, if this is the last bulwark of freedom, I might as well die here as anywhere. I'm sorry to say that she identified many of the men threatening her as Unitarians, members of her own Federal Street Church ministered by William Ellery Channing. However, since Deborah described the incident as the day when 5,000 men mobbed 45 women, I'm confident they weren't all Federal Street Unitarians. Even in Boston, even with the man who founded the AUA, we just didn't have that kind of numbers. Next up is Edwin Wheelock. Before the Civil War, Edwin was a Unitarian minister, raising a family in Dover, New Hampshire. He spoke out strongly against alcohol and slavery. His UUA article mentions something I hadn't thought of before. Our many temperance and abolition ministers often paid a personal financial price for their stands. Their strong opinions alienated part of their congregations who left or gave less which made it hard to pay a good salary. The UUA calls this, quote, the usual result, unquote. In 1859, Edwin went to Boston and preached in favor of John Brown's raid. He predicted that copycat rebels would rise up all across the North and free the slaves. The state of Virginia offered a $1,500 reward for Edwin, dead or alive. In the Civil War, Edwin was an army chaplain serving on the Mississippi River. And since he was a known abolitionist, he was appointed to look into rumors of mistreatment on Union-run plantations. Ironically, but necessarily, the Union Army put newly freed blacks to work as forced labor to prevent economic collapse and starvation. Edwin swallowed any misgivings he may have had, and he gave the system a thumbs up. In 1863, Edwin was appointed inspector of schools for freedmen in the Department of the Gulf, which was the name of the military government 
in the Gulf state areas occupied by the Union Army. Edwin continued the same work after the war, moving his family to Texas to work for the Freedman's Bureau. Providing good education for black Texans was a difficult job in 1965, so you can imagine. Wheelock only opened schools in towns that had military garrisons and only in buildings brave enough to face public censure and a high risk of violence. Even so, Edwin estimated that his department taught over 10,000 freedmen to read and write in his five-year tenure. It was the most successful and the longest lasting department of the Freedman's Bureau. Next up is Kate Gannett Wells. Here's a really good early photograph. The subject is Kate Gannett Wells, the daughter of Boston's leading Unitarian minister, Ezra Gannett. Ezra was a single parent after his wife died in 1846. From him, Kate got a strong sense of mission in social justice. Kate married well at age 25, which freed her for 45 years of volunteer work in education. She served with the Massachusetts Moral Education Association, whose mandate was to reduce prostitution by providing the women with education and charitable support. Also with the Massachusetts State Board of Education for 24 years and several other institutions. In 1875, Kate was elected by mail votes only to a one year term on the Boston School Committee. In 1879, Massachusetts gave women the right to vote for school supervisors, considering it to be within the proper domain of mothers. Every year from 1882 onwards, suffragists in Massachusetts petitioned to extend women's votes to all elected officials. But every year, Kate Wells registered herself as opposed to that petition. By and large, Unitarians were strong supporters of suffrage, but opinions differed. Kate said, quote, she looked at to a non-political, altruistic and service-minded womankind as the antidote to society's ills, unquote. Kate was a minor author, including a, uh, almost inevitably, a children's book, something that Unitarians seem to love to do. Her best known work seems to be a history of Campobello, which is an island in Maine. And next up we have Eliza Tupper Wilkes. Here she is, young, old, and famous with a sign in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Eliza was a circuit riding minister, well known in many Western towns. She started 11 Universalist and Unitarian congregations. In 1901, she moved to California and threw herself into the women's suffrage movement. She helped them win suffrage for women in California state elections in 1911. She later traveled to Budapest and England to support the same cause. This is Alfred T. White. Alfred Treadway White was a reform-minded land developer and a philanthropist. His housing developments in Brooklyn, designed by William Field and Son, won enthusiastic praise. Alfred followed Cecil Rhodes' philosophy of, quote, philanthropy, philanthropy plus 5%, unquote. The internet has different, sometimes naive, interpretations of what that means. I'm pretty sure what it means is that Alfred did well by doing good. He took a 5% profit, but no more, and he built the best apartments that he could. They had large courtyards to encourage a neighborhood feeling. While he was skating in uh, upstate New York at age 75, he fell through the ice and drowned. His Unitarian minister, William Howard Taft, said, I don't know any other one in all that six millions of New York City who would leave such a void as he does. And next we have Francis Williams, known as Fanny Williams, was raised in Brockport in upstate New York. It's a mostly white town with a refreshingly low rate of segregation and of prejudice. Her father was a middle-class barber and coal merchant 
and Fanny was the first black person to graduate as a teacher from their normal school. Normal school is what people used to call a, a teacher's college. She went first to teach in the South, but found the prejudice and physical intimidation too much to bear. So she went to Boston to study piano at the New England Conservatory of Music. But again, racism blocked her path. She was asked to leave after complaints from the white students. But she found acceptance in Washington, DC, where she taught school and studied portrait painting at the School of Fine Arts. She married a young black lawyer and they moved to Chicago. After making friends with white reformers like Jane Addams, the founder of Hull House, they joined All Souls Unitarian Church in Chicago. <coughs> the Williamses prospered. They established a black study club and a biracial hospital. Fanny is most famous for successfully getting black representation on the board of control for the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. They did not get the African-American exhibit that they requested, but she contributed exhibits to the Women's Hall. She also gave two controversial speeches at the fair to the World's Congress of Representative Women and to the World's Parliament of Religions. The Parliament of Religions met for the first time at the 1893 World's Fair, and their most recent meeting was in Toronto in 2018. Uh, I've decided that the Chicago World's Fair itself is by, beyond my scope, but it has tons of interesting trivia, including a large number of firsts, such as first moving sidewalk and many people's first experiences with electricity. And it also featured the, the assassination of Chicago's mayor Someone really should make a big budget movie about it. Our list of minor agents of change goes on and on. Next up, we have Whitney M. Young. I have almost 1,000 biographies in UU A to Z. And despite a large number of abolitionists and civil rights activists, uh, at the time I uh, wrote this, I only had 20 blacks. I think I've added uh, a few more than that since reading... Uh, a book on the black empowerment controversy. <clears throat> anyway, of the 20, six are in the WYZ Wise Unitarians. And here's the second one back to back. Whitney Young was a, an upper class, uh, sorry, an upper middle class black from Kentucky. He became an aggressive civil rights activist working through the National Urban League. The league was founded before Whitney's birth with the mission, quote, to enable African Americans to secure economic self-reliance, parity, power, and civil rights, unquote. They had successes even before Whitney became the executive director in 1961, but he increased fundraising by a factor of almost 20, and he took the organization from 38 employees to 1,600 employees in just four years. Under Whitney, NUL, uh, that's the National Urban League, hosted the meeting which planned Martin Luther King Jr.'s march on Washington. They started Street Academy to prepare high school dropouts for college and New Thrust to support local level black leaders in solving community problems. In an era of civil rights activism, Whitney was an important political advisor to Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon. Johnson awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Sadly, Whitney drowned in 1971 while attending a conference in Nigeria. President Nixon sent a plane to collect the body and went to Kentucky to deliver a eulogy at his funeral. It included the line, he knew how to accomplish what other people were merely for. And I can think of no better compliment for an agent of change. Uh, Irvin Waller. I hope I have not misidentified Irvin Waller as UU. He has been in my database for years, but when I took a, when I took a deeper look, I could only find that he sometimes speaks at First Unitarian of Ottawa. 
and I haven't asked anyone over there to confirm him. So I present him as a definite maybe. Here we probably have a UU. Irvin Waller is Canadian Professor of Criminology at the University of Ottawa with a PhD from Cambridge. He's also an activist for victims' rights. He is the first Vice President of the International Center for Victim Assistance and was the founder and first director of the UN-affiliated International Center for the Prevention of Crime. Irvin is tough on crime. Here's his biographical blurb on what that means to him. Quote, money directed toward penal justice is better spent addressing risk factors that cause violence. Drawing on scientific research and decades of experience in advising governments, Waller shows how planned investments in services for women, at-risk youth, families and neighborhoods are more effective in preventing violence than traditional reactive approaches. Paying for services to support victims and guaranteeing their rights is better than tough on crime rhetoric, he adds, and achieves uh, it's achievable and affordable, according to research." Unquote. Uh, his book, Less Law, More Order, is selling well in five languages, and he says he was a major influence on Alberta's $500 million crime reduction and community safety strategy. And our last in this category, Zach Walls. He's a young LGBTQ human rights activist. He came to public notice at a 2011 hearing before the Iowa House Judiciary Committee, which was considering an amendment to the state constitution that would make gay marriage illegal. He gave a terrific three minute speech about his own experience being raised by his two lesbian mothers. His speech went straight to YouTube and had over 15 million views in the first 15 months. I do recommend it. It's a wonderful little piece of rhetoric. The Economist magazine linked to the video with the tagline, this is what it looks like to win an argument. <laughs> On another occasion, Zach said, quote, I might be a straight cisgender man, but in my mind, I am a member of the LGBT community. I do know what it's like to be in the closet. And like every other member of the LGBT community, I did not have a choice in this. I was born into this movement, unquote. Zach dropped out of university to concentrate on activism and a business career, especially his book, My Two Moms, which he co-wrote with best-selling author Bruce Littlefield. On November 7, 2018, age 27, Zach became a senator in the Iowa State Senate. He appears to be an ambitious and effective young man, so keep your eye on him. And since that mentions government, it's a nice segue into government. Meanwhile, 480 years ago, we start with John II Sigismund, Sigismund Chapolea. Chapol <coughs> Let me try again. Maybe I can get it this time. John Sigismund Chapolai. Uh, he was the disputed king of Hungary from the age of nine days and he was the undisputed Prince of Transylvania at the time of his death. His dad was John I, King of Hungary, who sired him and promptly died. His mom was Isabella of Poland, who struggled to keep him on the throne. John's competition for the throne was Ferdinand I, a Holy Roman Emperor. Ferdinand claimed Hungary on the perfectly reasonable grounds that John's dad, John I had signed a treaty in 1538, making Ferdinand his heir. However, once a son was born, most of the Hungarian nobles backed the baby. Both kings claimed all of Hungary. John had control of the East, and he got to use this cool coat of arms featuring a crowned eagle, a howling wolf, a unicorn, and a crowned snake swallowing a man. Holy kermoli. It probably has a long history, but I prefer to believe that seven-year-old John took some crayons and drew it up himself. All of this happened in the shadow of the 16th century superpower, 
which was the Ottoman Empire. John's entire kingdom was inside the Ottoman Empire. John was a vassal king, ruling at the sufferance of Suleiman the Magnificent, the sultan who captured Budapest and led his armies to the gates of Vienna. Thanks to Ottoman record keepers, we have pictures of three appearances by John's family before Suleiman. Uh, on the left, we have his dad getting the crown. In the middle, we have his mom renewing the homage on behalf of her baby. And on the right, we have John as an adult leading, leaning, kneeling before Suleiman. Well, John lost his throne at age 11 when his own treasurer, uh, backstabbed him and backed Emperor Ferdinand against him. He and his mom accepted a payment to leave and they moved to Poland. However, Suleiman exerted his influence to get John back on the throne at age 16, where he stayed until age 30. John ceded control to Ferdinand's son Maximilian and reduced his own title to Prince of Transylvania and Lord of parts of the Kingdom of Hungary and he died from illness the next year. John was always open and curious about religion. At age 22, he converted from Roman Catholic to Lutheran. At age 24, he switched to Calvinist. And at age 29, after discussions with his physician, Giorgio Biandrata and court preacher, Frank David, he became Europe's first and only Unitarian king in what we'll call modern times at any rate. He passed the Edict of Torda in 1568, granting every district the right to choose its own religion and prohibiting persecution for religious reasons. Now a big jump to America, Daniel Webster born 1782. Uh, perhaps like me, you know Daniel Webster best from the one-act play by Stephen Vincent Benet, The Devil and Daniel Webster. It's a great story, retold many times. For our purposes, the point is that Daniel Webster was a great orator, a speechmaker who could talk his way around the devil. The real Daniel was born in New Hampshire, and he had a law career in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. He was the superstar lawyer of his generation kind of like an F. Lee Bailey, I guess. Uh, he argued hundreds of cases before the Supreme Court. Most modern UUs would cheer for most of his causes, but not all of his causes. He championed free trade against tariffs, the federal government against the states, business against the government, and family businesses against big minimum wage factories. His most famous case was Dartmouth College versus Woodward. It established the principle that New Hampshire couldn't, couldn't pass a law changing Dartmouth from a private college to a public one. So by extension, it gave all corporations protection against nationalization from all levels of US government. Daniel became a federal congressman and then senator. He was twice secretary of state. He made three failed runs at the presidency twice refusing to run as vice president. You know, on the, the first occasion, President William Harrison died one month in, into his office. So Daniel would have succeeded him. Uh, instead, another Unitarian, Millard Fillmore, got the job. In 1847, Daniel introduced a bill in Congress to produce prepaid adhesive postage stamps. Whether or not that's the reason, he himself has been honored on 14 different US postage stamps. He attended a Unitarian church in Washington, but Daniel ended up later in life as an Episcopalian. A Unitarian once asked him how a man of his intellect could believe in the Trinity. He responded that he believed because he believed, but he did not, quote, understand the arithmetic of heaven, unquote. Daniel has been criticized for supporting the Compromise of 1850, which was one of several attempts before 1860 to avoid the Civil War. The Compromise included a law 
that northern states must return runaway slaves to their owners. So extradition of people that southerners considered property, but whom northerners and everyone today considered to be free men. There were some devils that even Daniel couldn't get around. Next, we have Alexander Workman, the first of many Canadian workmen that we're going to come across. Alexander was born in Ireland. He immigrated to Canada in 1820, and he was the mayor of Ottawa from 1860 to 1861. That was before it was the capital of anything. That was when it was called Bytown still, I believe. Uh, no, my mistake. Bytown was renamed Ottawa in 1855, I see. Anyway, Alexander was not important enough to get his face on the internet, but uh, he was important enough to score this giant grave site. You could almost play a soccer game in there. There are four women listed with him on the memorial, a wife, a daughter, and two granddaughters. Alexander tried to start a Unitarian church in Ottawa, but he failed, and so that's enough about him. We're moving on to Thomas Whitmore. He was a big fish in a small pond. He was the most influential universalist editor of the 19th century. He was a protege of Hosea Ballou, and in 1828, he founded the Trumpet and Universalist magazine. He also wrote The Modern History of Universalism, and he founded the Universalist Historical Society. So why is he under politics? Well, Thomas was an alderman for Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a rep in the Massachusetts legislature. He chaired a special house committee to disestablish the Unitarian and Congregationalist religions, to disestablish them. In other words, to stop giving tax money to those churches. So remember, in 1833, Unitarianism and Universalism were different religions. Unitarian congregations uh, in many towns were established and they got government money, but the Universalists never did. Some Unitarians, I'm sorry to say, fought to keep their subsidy. And that means, and I kid you not, that they were anti-disestablishmentarianisms. I think that is supercalifragilistic expialidocious. And if you disagree, I will not listen to your flocky nucky and the healy peely vacation. After a referendum had proved voters were in favor, Massachusetts did disestablish all churches. They had been the last holdout in the United States. Now all the states were aligned with the federal first amendment in separating church and state, which you see under the constitution was only a, uh, was only a federal law. And now in uh, 1833, everybody in the states is lined up with that federal law. Of course, the battle over mixing religion and politics continues today. After the Arkansas State Capitol put up a statue of the Ten Commandments on their front lawn, protesters from the Satanic Temple made a tongue-in-cheek request to install the statue of Baphomet beside it. That is not a UU story uh, because the Satanic Temple is not a UU organization. But UUs, both from principle and because they are a minority, are now consistent supporters of the First Amendment. I love that statue. They, uh, let me remember, I think it was, I think it was the TV show Sabrina the Teenage Witch that got sued for using that image, which is a, an original of the uh, Satanic Temple. Satanic Temple, by the way, is not a bunch of Satan worshippers, they are a bunch of atheists who, like the people who back the flying spaghetti monster, are uh, have sort of invented or misappropriated a religion in order to prove their First Amendment point. That's enough about them. Let's get back to a Unitarian. Let's get back to John Young, born in 1811. He was born in Ayr, Scotland, and he skipped being a teenager. At age 14, he graduated and became a teacher. At age 15, 
He emigrated to Kingston to join an import-export business. He almost immediately moved to Montreal, where warehouses were crammed with goods from point A, which were waiting to be sent on to point B. Well, John was obsessed with the efficient movement of goods. For decades, he tried to build a Cognawaga Canal that would have connected Kahnawake on the St. Lawrence to Lake Champlain on New York, and that would have allowed cargo to bypass Montreal. At least that's what John's merchant friends thought and feared. Leave well enough alone, they say. Don't leave us high and dry. Don't leave us with empty warehouses. And the new canal was never built. I believe even to this day, it's never been built. Luckily for John's legacy, that was not his only project. He pushed for and got dredging of the St. Lawrence east of Montreal and the construction of Montreal's first railways and the building of Victoria Bridge, which was the first bridge to cross the St. Lawrence River. He also served on the Montreal Harbor Commission and was president of the Board of Trade. John went into politics where he was apparently a maverick and a prickly fellow. One debate led to a pistol duel but no one was hurt. Before Confederation, John won election with the Parti Rouge and held an appropriate cabinet post, Chief Commissioner for Public Works. After Confederation, he won the Montreal West seat as a Liberal, but uh, the Liberals during his time were never in power. In the mid 1870s, John's business was faltering he had used up most of his political goodwill, and the best job he could get was as delegate to an international trade conference in Australia. So off he went. That sounds like fun to me, but his health was not up to it, and he died in Montreal from illness that he contracted on the voyage home. The flourishing port of Montreal and its success for the past 150 years are a testament to John's work and vision, and he has a statue in the old port. And that is the end of the government section. And we're going to move on to education. Benjamin Workman was a man from Ballymacash, Ireland. When he was four years old, his mother boosted him up to look over a hedge at the next village, which was burning. That was the Battle of Antrim, part of the Irish Rebellion of 1798, started by disaffected liberal Presbyterians, which would have included proto-Unitarians, and which was joined by the Catholic Irish and by revolutionary France. Benjamin became a teacher at Ballymacash. At age 23, he saw a group of 11 men come begging at his father's farm. Seeing no good future in Ballymacash, he left for Montreal, Canada. His parents and eight siblings eventually followed him. So Benjamin is responsible for all of the other Canadian workmen who are in this show. He worked in Canada as a teacher and a publisher and an editor and a doctor, including a job with his more famous brother, Joseph, in Toronto's lunatic asylum. Benjamin's Unitarian activities are less stellar he disliked the Montreal minister, John Cordner, so he tried to change the congregation to a Presbyterian model, giving power to the church elders instead of to the minister. When the congregation wouldn't play ball, he just quit. Ah, Benjamin, you quitter. So we'll move on to Alfred North Whitehead, a little bit famous. He was a British mathematician and philosopher. I'll start with a quote from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Quote, the, staggeringly, the, the staggering complexity of Whitehead's thought, coupled with the extraordinary literary quality of his writing, have conspired to make Whitehead one of the most quoted but least read philosophers in the Western canon, unquote. Bertrand Russell was Alfred's student at Cambridge, and he became Alfred's collaborator. Their three-volume Principia Mathematica 
which was published when Alfred was about 50, tried to put math on a firm footing forever, showing how to prove all existing and future theorems from a few basic axioms. A nice try, but 20 years later, Kurt Gödel used set theory to prove that this holy grail can never be obtained. But the books still stand as a famous exploration of formal math. Alfred was a pioneer in Mario topology, which studies an abstract relationship between wholes and parts. One of their burning questions, is the whole thing a part of the thing? In other words, does the full set uh, include the full set? Alfred said, it requires a very unusual mind to undertake the analysis of the obvious, unquote. <laughs> uh, as a math major, I loved doing that stuff. But, you know, I actually left math because I thought it spent too much time discussing things with no practical application. Obviously, I'm not talking about all of math, which has been incredibly fruitful. Uh, I kind of like it, though, that there's a branch of math named pointless topology. Anyway, I was happy to learn that Mario topology has indeed been found useful in digital manufacturing, geography, and especially in computer science. So it's actually kind of difficult to do pure research and find out in the end that it's good for nothing at all. About age 55, Alfred's interests took him into the philosophy of scientific knowledge. He wrote a Principles of Natural Knowledge, uh, The Concept of Nature, and a book on the implications of Einstein's discovery that time was relative. He grew up, worked, and raised a family in England at Cambridge and the University of London. And as he neared 65, he faced mandatory retirement, which he was not ready for. So he escaped to Harvard University and did not retire until age 73. Alfred uh, was raised at Church of England, and he became an unchurched deist. That's, that was his history of religion in, uh, in England. So it was only in America that he got his tenuous UU connection. He gave a key lecture series on God at King's Chapel, which is the oldest Unitarian church in America. He also said, the Unitarians come the nearest to having found a way to adapt the Christian ideas to the world we live in, unquote. He is a key figure in one of Reverend Peter Bellata's favorite subjects, process theology. Alfred was a private man and there has never been a definitive biography. <clears throat> Certainly this isn't it. Uh, his family followed his wishes and burned all of his personal papers when he died. And I'll just end with a few of his quotes. A Unitarian is a person who believes in, at most, one God. Next, in formal logic, a contradiction is a signal of defeat, but in the evolution of real knowledge, it marks the first step in progress towards a victory. Next, all science as it grows toward perfection becomes mathematical in its ideas. Next. The guiding motto in the life of every natural philosopher should be seek simplicity and distrust it. And lastly, philosophy begins in wonder. And at the end, when philosophic thought has done its best, the wonder remains. Here comes Samuel Williston. He was from a poor branch of a wealthy merchant family. He started as a school teacher, but when a rich aunt left him money, he instead enrolled in Harvard Law School. He was an editor of the very first volume of the Harvard Law Review. He graduated at the top of his class, and at age 34, he became a Harvard Law professor. He was effective and popular. He liked to invent case studies involving his horse 
Dobbin, and he held dinners for his students. At the same time, he was practicing corporate contract law. He wrote an influential textbook, The Law of Contracts, which became the authority in the English speaking world. And he wrote four federal laws to standardize contracts. They were the Uniform Law of Sales, Warehouse Receipts, Bills of Lading, and Stock Transfers. Much later, these became building blocks for the Uniform Commercial Code, which was issued in 1952. Uh, I didn't expect to get interested in the Universal Commercial Code, uh, but I did. Section 2-207 governs, quote, the battle of the forms, unquote. So suppose CIBC buys paper supplies from Dunder Mifflin Paper Company, or maybe from Dobbin the Horse. They trade requests for proposals, invoices, purchase orders, and order confirmations, all on their own standard forms with their own legal small print. Well, if things go wrong and it gets taken to court, whose small print wins? Grant Gilmore at Yale called it arguably the greatest statutory mess of all time. Williston was made a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He had honorary degrees from Harvard, Amherst, and Yale. In 1929, he received the very first American Bar Association Medal for conspicuous service to American jurisprudence. All in all, he might be the most important academic that none of us has ever heard of. Our next guy, our next woman is Carolyn Ferrer Ware, who was known as Lena. She was a great, great granddaughter of Henry Ware, the man who made Unitarianism the religion of Harvard Divinity School. Unitarianism, academics and social action were all in the family for five generations, and Lena upheld the tradition. She was educated at Vassar, Oxford, and Radcliffe, and she was a professor of history at Vassar. Her PhD dissertation was on New England cotton mills. It won a $10,000 prize for showing how mills changed the nature of rural life and set a pattern for America's industrial development. Lena married in 1927 to Gardner Means, an economist at Columbia University, and he co-authored some work with Lena, but I can't find any evidence that he was a Unitarian, just her. Their meet cute story is that they fought over the words delta and estuary, one claiming that both words referred to land and the other claiming that one of the words referred to water. Soon after learning that they were each half right, they were married by an illiterate justice of the peace who almost forgot to show up for the wedding. In 1931, Lena took leave from Vassar and joined her husband in New York City. Lena and her research assistants rented an office for two years in Greenwich Village and published Greenwich Village 1920 to 1930, which they published in 1935. The village was already an artist community back then, and Lena told that story, but she spent much more time on its multicultural working class community. Throughout her life, Lena emphasized the social history of the working class rather than elites and institutions. Lena said, as Louis Adamic has pointed out, it is to Ellis Island rather than Plymouth Rock that a great part of the American people trace their history in America. More people have died in industrial accidents than in subduing the wilderness and fighting the revolution." Unquote. In 1933, Gardner was hired by the Department of Agriculture in FDR's New Deal bureaucracy, and Lena joined him. She created a new understanding of consumer affairs, the idea that consumers were a class who needed to be protected against predatory selling practices. Her last big project, though by no means the end of her intellectual career, was the first edition of the six volume UNESCO 
History of Cultural and Scientific Development of Mankind, written between 1946 and 1966. Lena outlived her co-authors and finished the work alone. It was replaced in the year 2009 by an all new edition. It's available in several languages, but I must admit the English version hasn't made much of a splash on the internet. Our last guy for the day is Charles Conrad Wright, called Conrad. He had a PhD in Unitarian history, but he died in 2011, so you're stuck with me. Uh, maybe I should read some of his stuff someday, but ignorance is bliss. Uh, he was also the leading historian on Harvard Divinity School, where he taught for 33 years. And that's the end of today's show. Stop.